Did you know that personal information, like addresses and phone numbers, is collected and sold by data brokers across the internet? Fortunately, Aura steps in, scanning the web, sending you alerts, and requesting the removal of your info when found. Get a 14-day free trial of Aura's full toolkit, including ID theft protection, parental controls, and more at Aura.com slash safety. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash safety. This is a Shares for Beginners quick tip. Essential lessons, questions answered. There's a 54% chance that any given day on the ASX will be an up day. It might not feel like it at the moment, but that statistic holds true over a longer period of time. This interview was recorded last November and there have been two changes. We were still in a bull or up market and Anthony Doyle was working as a fundy at Fidelity. He's now with Firetrail. In this quick tip, Anthony talks about the difference between large fund management and individual investors, active ETFs as a way of accessing emerging markets, and acknowledging as humans we're hardwired for fear. One of the best things you can do during periods of volatility or bull markets such as this, obviously you look at valuation measures, you look at whether the fundamentals of the market are strong, you look at whether the valuations represent cheapness, fair value or are expensive, and you also look at technical factors like whether there are flows coming into and out of the market. But one of the best things you can do, and one thing that I was highlighting last year, was that one of the best things to do is to extend your time horizon of investing. <clears throat> so on any given day, there's a higher probability that the market is up than down because markets generally trend higher over time because guess what? The economy is growing, which is again that link back to macro. So there's a 54% probability that the market is up from 1979, the ASX 200 in total return terms. Whereas if you extend your time horizon to five years, no one has lost money. Even if you bought the day before a huge bear market like Black Monday in 1987, like um, the tech crash, like the GFC, mm. like COVID-19. Obviously, you have experienced great volatility, great falls at the time, but after five years in total return terms, you're up. So this is the way that generational wealth thinks, long-term investors. This is the way that superannuation funds think. This is the way that endowments think, family offices. And too often, we get caught up in the noise. And the reason is... Again, going back to those behavioural insights, we feel losses far more acutely than we feel windfall gains, which is why we're so hesitant to sell a company at a loss because of that loss aversion, which is why so many investors will hold on until they get back to their entry level. When you should really be assessing a company if you're looking to sell on the fundamentals then and there as opposed to you know, any sort of price target that you might have in mind. So one of the best things to do is extend your time horizon. And I often talk to investors and they'll say, I'm a long-term investor, I'm patient capital. But when it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket and the, the headlines are screaming at you. And everyone's sell, running from the door. And running from everyone's the running yeah. and everyone's investment time horizon collapses to a yeah. day, mm -hmm. to a week. So having those goals in mind when you're investing, understanding your own time preference of money, understanding what liabilities you might have as well. Often we see that those that are forced to sell because of margin calls, these are sophisticated investors, leverage like hedge funds, they're forced sellers. Even if you see some of the crazy price action on individual stocks, it might be short covering. They've been short and they've had to buy back the stock. Which has the effect of increasing the price. Exactly. This Explosively. Is Tesla, yep. one of the most shorted stocks, yep. obviously, and you've seen the price action there too. This is you know, just noise, really. It is fundamentally noise. And again, when you think about the evolution of humans from the African savannas, we're hardwired to fear things, you know, is that a stick over there or a snake? And this is why when you open a paper, it's not good news you're reading, mm. right? It's always, yeah. you know, but that's what's going to attract your attention. That's what's going to get your eyeballs. And in this world of social media and amplification of messages, it's something that you have to be really acutely aware of. And, you know, to tell you the truth, the advice of a good financial advisor, I think, held Australians in good stead last year. Overwhelmingly, clients were 
putting money to work at that time. When I say putting money to work, investing in the market as opposed to selling equities, selling shares. It was generally the institutional client bases that we saw around the world that were the ones doing the selling. And it was actually the retail buyer that came in most quickly after the bear market occurred. So that's something to consider as well. So I would say that an important lesson is that being liquid, what we call you know, having a large cash buffer in place, when you can deploy, when markets do have those sell-offs, is another good way. You know, Tilting into risk is another good way to generate long-term returns as well. It's interesting that you say that, that um, retail investors were the ones that were holding their heads high and institutional investors were the ones selling because Gemma Dale, who was on a few months ago now, was mentioning, because she's got a lot of data about what people are buying, and there were younger retail investors buying banks, buying BHP, just buying Wes Farmers and those regular stocks. And um, it seems to be a real turnaround that they're keeping their heads as opposed to the institutional investors. Well, again, remember when I spoke about the time preference of money? The great advantage that the retail investor has is they're not reporting their returns on oh, it's a the quarterly, monthly, it's the quarterly, quarterly returns. annual, yeah. three-year return cycle. The professional investors, it's very visible whether they're underperforming or yeah. outperforming their index and it attracts inflows or you might have redemptions from your portfolio as a result as well. So retail investors have a great advantage yeah. in that they can extend their time horizon and they can also withstand volatility to a much greater extent relative to the institutional professional portfolio managers. So that is a great advantage yeah. that, that retail investors have in terms of the time preference of money. They aren't for sellers when the volatility occurs. A lot of the times as a professional money manager, your fund may be facing withdrawals. Um, so you have to meet those withdrawals by selling equities when you might not want to sell them. And the reverse, again, as a good portfolio manager, they will typically be liquid enough to deal with those sort of redemption profiles. But guess what? A lot of professional portfolio managers aren't like that. They chase returns. So again, doing your due diligence on individual companies and shares, you should do the same sort of due diligence on fund management firms like a Fidelity, for example. You know, Do your due diligence on our strategy. Look at the return profile. Look at the volatility. Look at the sharp ratio. Look at the competitors that we're competing against and see if our funds stack up. And uh, I'm confident that they will. They don't mm-hmm. all, of course. Um, I'm confident that they will. But definitely do your due diligence when you're looking at an active ETF or a unit trust as well. So you don't have a short-term incentive in place or there's short-term imperatives at uh, Fidelity? No, portfolio managers are remunerated on their performance mm-hmm. um, against a benchmark. So all yeah. the funds have benchmarks. So the Australian Equity Fund will try and outperform the ASX 200 in total mm-hmm. return terms. So there is a quantitative element in terms of the performance of the fund itself and also yeah. a qualitative element as well in terms of you know teamwork and the contribution to fidelity as a business and things like that. It's incredible now just to think that you know a few short years ago these were the only ways that you could really invest, you know. Well, active and ETFs have been such a game changer yeah, and you're, yeah. you're now seeing dual listed mm-hmm. um, as well. So that's whatever right, your yeah. preference is. So I think that's the way the world is traveling and, and we're certainly headed in that direction as well depending on the preference of the investor, whether they mm-hmm. want to get exposure, say, to emerging markets via unit trust, so they come through Fidelity, or whether they buy on the Australian Stock Exchange. I think it's quite unique to Australia. I think Canada is another market that has active ETFs. But when I came back, I had to educate myself on this because I'd been used to investors getting exposure via unit trusts in Europe and the UK. And I I think it's just a fantastic way that democratises the ability of investors to get access to these hard-to-access parts of the world Mm. for themselves. Mm. You know, I've spoken in the past at presentations and I've identified companies that Australian investors just had no idea. You know, one is Tektronic, right? So if they've gone to Bunnings and they've bought a Ryobi hand tool, well, it's a Hong Kong domiciled company that own Ryobi and Mm. Hoover. Yeah, I've spoken in the past about the guy that lit the Olympic cauldron at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. He's got a company called Li Ning, a sports manufacturing and equipment company that's up, you know, I think around 300, 400% in the last couple of years. No one had heard of Li Ning. And obviously, he's, you know, extremely household name in China, for example, I mean, having that Kathy Freeman type profile. So there's just a plethora of opportunities in these markets, emerging markets, where 
they can follow the sort of growth trajectory that we've seen, say, an Amazon have or a Netflix have in terms of the tech areas, but also they are increasingly competing with developed market companies on other areas, not only tech, but healthcare and and finance, and they have huge markets that they can tap into. Remember, Mm. Australia, our population is 25 million, and I think uh, the adult population is around 18 million, right? Whereas you look at China and you're talking about 1.4 billion people and you're talking about a global middle class that's growing by around 850 million in the next 10 years and most of that in Asia. I think increasingly Australian investors will have to have an allocation to emerging markets. They haven't historically had to. They've been really spoiled by the returns that they've been able to generate by just being invested in Australian assets. Increasingly, I think Australians will want to allocate to riskier parts of the world with the aim of generating those higher returns and and help them meet their investment and savings goals over a long period of time. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free true crime to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. 